Matt Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Heavenly Father, as I offer words this morning, I pray and beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. The the scripture uh, is full of people who try to hide from God and from Jesus. We could consider right off the bat the first story of Adam and Eve who hide from God uh, at the end of the day when he comes to walk in the garden. Or we might think of Jonah, who doesn't particularly want to do what God wants him to do, and so he seeks to hide, and God ensures he hides in the belly of a whale for a little bit to get his mind straight. Or Esther, Esther who keeps believing that she's not called to go on God's behalf to save her people. Uh, Nicodemus, right, uh, he comes in the middle of the night, hiding from everybody, hoping to have an audience with Jesus. Perhaps the woman even who reaches out to Jesus and touches his cloak amidst the crowd, hoping nobody will notice. No matter what we do, I find it is very difficult to hide from God. Our passage today reads, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat among the shadow of death, light has dawned, so repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The scripture offers us two ideas that are coexisting, if you will, in this passage. That's what I want to talk to you all about today, okay, these two things. And the first is this. Humans, you and I, feel shame. Now, we do a lot of things to pretend like we don't feel shame, but the truth is we feel shame about a lot of different things. We feel shame about our bodies, sometimes about our feelings, sometimes about not being able to hide our feelings in front of others. We might feel shame about beauty or not having enough or feeling powerless in the world. So we have this internal conflict kind of built into us. Now, I'm not trying to shame you for having shame. (laughs) I'm just trying to name the fact we all do it. It's normal. It's a human behavior. We might say that's part of the brokenness that humans have inside of them. The thing is that we're also good at shaming others. Uh, Uh, giving to those around us a little bit of what we're feeling. Uh, Now, you and I can always think of the kind of powerful, open, transparent ways in which people shame each other. You know, we would talk about trying to stop bullying in our schools, for instance, right? Like, so we know kind of the, the, the outward signs of shame, but I find the problem that most of us have is the subtle shame that we pass on to others in our homes, in our families, and in our workplaces. And these are that kind of quiet displeasure, that, that feigned interest as if you've actually already been talking too long. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that, that idea of, uh, of not wanting to talk to others, uh, maybe because of something they've said and done, rather than seeking reconciliation, actually dealing with the issues. We like to kind of pretend that will just, you know, shoo them away in some subtle way. And I think that that's a very real part of the shame. It's easy for us to think back in our own lives of things people have told us outright that's been terrible, right? Well, we, do, we all do the same thing. And you can say to me, oh, Bishop, uh, I'm more saintly than that. Good for you. So the other 99% of us in the room, uh, we're going to work on this, this uh, feeling we've got around shame. What I want to say is that God, God, we can't hide it. 
No matter how hard we try and put all of this in shadowy places or pretend like it's not happening, tell us our own stories to defend our shaming of others, or repeat the shame we've received as if it's true, uh, God's light comes in, breaks into that. That's the, that's the message, that, that you can't hide that. God sees it clearly for what it is, both your pain and suffering and repeating these terrible messages that you've received, maybe even over your whole life, and the poor way in which you've treated others and shamed others. God sees it all. So whether or not you think you're hiding it and keeping it to yourself, there's at least two of you who know what you're doing. <laughs> now, I, I want to be honest that I have the same problem. Uh, I have always been the biggest kid. Uh, I mean, look at me. And I have, I've lived with that. I've lived with the, and you think I don't know it, right? But I do. And I've heard the words. I was teased in high school. I've been teased my whole life about it. It's teased in the process of getting into ministry. Now, I work on it, and I wrestle with it myself, but I'm just going to say, I carry that quite literally with me all the time. So I'm not just talking to you. I'm talking with you about this. But what I've learned over time is that God's light of love shines into every corner of our life and brightens those areas where the ghosts and specters of the past continue to haunt us. The lies that we tell ourselves that others tried to convince us were true. God's love reveals that we are accepted, you and I. We are worthy of belonging, that God loves us, and that this is part of this light that is being disp dispelled, if you will, in the Scripture, both in our Old Testament reading and in our New, saying that there are no principalities or powers that can hold us or keep us from the light of Christ. That reveals how much we are loved by God. And indeed, we are loved by God. Now, uh, along with uh, the story I just shared you, my guess is uh, my, I have walked a very broken road in my relationship with Jesus and haven't always been faithful and haven't always done the right thing, and uh, as a young person, wandered this way and that way. And, but you know what? God still loves me. God still loves me. And God loved me so much that even before I knew I needed God's love, Christ was crucified to show God's love for me. This is the message of the Scripture. And when we pray... To, to ask God to clean our hearts before worship. It's, a, it's as if we were asking to come into this place and to enable us to just be who we are. The shame we carry, the wrongs we've done, and allow that to just fall away in the presence of God and the presence of God's love. That's why that prayer at the beginning of this service is so important. Jesus says uh, to each named uh, saint, those people I... I named and others to slaves and widow, the widow of Nain to the shepherd boy, to the woman at the well, the fishermen, the religious leaders, the religiously abused, the women who followed, the anointed uh, uh, ones like Lazarus. Jesus says to each, I love you. Follow me. And uh, the truth is that the disciples continued that work to share God's love, didn't they? They they do drop their nets. They do follow. They do repent from all the ways they get it wrong throughout the story. It's not like once Jesus called them, they got it all right. We don't all know how the rest of the story goes. And the book of Acts is a whole list of things that they try to get right and normally get wrong, and God has to correct them about. Now, what I want to say to you is that you and I also have a response to this, this love of God. And it's pretty simple. I've been very focused on this during Epiphany because it seems to match. In other words, that if we have Christ's light shining on us, seeing us for who we really are, loving us anyway, then there must be some scripture that helps us remember what our response is. And for me, over this last month, it's been from the book of Hebrews, right, which talks about 
exactly what we are to do when we respond, this repentance to the Lord. How are we going to respond to God's love of us? And the truth is God doesn't ask a whole lot. But here are just some basic things that you can hold with you this week as it comes up. The fruit of lips that praise his name. That's the first thing from the book of Hebrews. God wants you to praise God's name. Now, we're doing a good job today singing. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's, it's good. I, I love it. We, we, you know, we're not sure we want to sing all six verses of him, but uh, it's good stuff. That's easy to do. But God wants us to praise God's name out in the world, give thanks at our dinner tables before we eat, to praise God, give thanks for what we received, If we're having a tough time to ask God for delivering us through it, this is what God wants, the praise of God's name. Second thing is to share what you have. Now, not everybody has the same amount to share, (laughs) but it is to share what we have, Uh, what little there is. You might think of the widow's might, right, from Scripture. It's a great example. God just wants you to share. Share what you have with others. And we're, the wonderful thing is we're going to break bread together. I've watched all that food go in there. And we're going to share some nice things as, right after this preacher stops preaching, aren't we? But share what you have during the week. If somebody asks for something, give them what you got. Sometimes all you may have is to say that God loves you and I love you. You may not have a, a dollar may not have anything to give him other than that. But that was okay for Peter and the man at the wall, wasn't it? I'll give you what I've been given. For gold and silver, I have not. The second thing is to do good work. And that's the last one. Do good work. We do good work by taking care of this congregation, by taking care of this church, your stewardship. That's good work. But do good work out there. I imagine you all do. If we sat down and said, where well, was a place where you helped somebody this week? Why? Well, we'd fill a whole hour of stories and narratives. But that's the other part. So the repentance that we do on Sunday morning, which is to hear of God's love through the gospel, to recognize that God loves us, no matter what we've been told about ourselves or what we have told others about themselves, to receive that love to realize that we are redeemed by it, to praise God's name, to share what we have, and do good works. You know, the gospel, G.K. Chesterton says, is not particularly difficult. It just is rarely tried. So as we go from this point on, Let us uh, reaffirm the faith that we have in Jesus, of who God is, how Jesus loves us. And let us repent and say our confession, laying before God all those things, knowing that God loves us anyway. And then break bread together, sharing what we have, and doing good works. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter, at Texas Bishop and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.